crowd. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you to the Preservation, Shel Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series, virtual programming about places that matter. My name is Clarissa Goodland, and I'm the Communications Director at Preservation North Carolina. And during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. We'll continue to add shelter series events throughout 2021, and you can visit our website um, at preservationnc.org for upcoming events. Um, we are delighted to present the shelter series to you free of charge, but of course, we're always grateful for your continued support of our programming. If you're enjoying this series, please consider a gift to help us keep it going. We provided a, a giving link in the survey that will appear at the end of the program, or you can visit our website at preservationnc.org. Uh, this afternoon, we're excited to present Josephus Daniels and Historic Wakestone. We'll be talking with uh, Daniels biographer, Professor Lee Craig, about the complex legacy of Josephus Daniels and the recent removal of the historic landmark designation of Daniels Historic Raleigh Home Wakestone and the role of historic properties in exploring challenging and sometimes problematic history. Uh, Dr. Lee Craig is the Alumni Distinguished Professor of Economics and the head of the Department of Economics at the Poole College of Management at NC State University. He received his BS and MA degrees from uh, Ball State University and an MA and PhD from Indiana University. Professor Craig teaches courses on micro and macroeconomics and financial markets and institutions. He has published over 100 books, including Josephus Daniels, His Life and Times, uh, scholarly articles, chapters, and reviews on these and related topics. Beyond his academic appointments, Professor Craig has appeared occasionally as a talking head on PBS and C-SPAN, and he has lectured and given seminars at universities and colleges around the world. Uh, we're also joined by PNC President Myra Howard and also by uh, education educator and Preservation North Carolina friend, Andrea Fields. Andrea grew up in historic Oberlin Village in Raleigh and as a child lived in the Graves Fields House, which is now the home of uh, Preservation North Carolina's headquarters. Andrea is a granddaughter of Spurgeon Fields, who was the owner of the Graves, Graves Fields House, a longtime chauffeur and later trusted confidant of Josephus Daniels. And before I turn it over to um, Professor Craig and our panelists, I just wanted to quickly go over a few um, Zoom FYIs for those of you who aren't familiar with um, our shelter series. Um, so let me just share screen quickly. Great, so as you all figured out, um, everyone is muted and your video is disabled except for our panelists. Um, so we can't hear or see you, but we know you're there. So we thank you all for coming. Um, we're recording and live streaming the webinar. So it will be available to view later on our website and our um, social media channels, YouTube, Facebook. Um, if you're having technical issues, uh, please utilize the chat function and we'll do our best to assist you. And we will be doing um, Q&A questions and answers at the end um, of the session. So I will be uh, moderating questions um, from attendees. And so you can submit a question throughout the presentation um, by clicking on either the chat function uh, button or the Q&A. Um, button. We prefer if you do the, the Q&A button, that makes it a little bit easier to moderate the questions, but the chat is fine as well. And then if you all would just take a few minutes at the end of the uh, webinar to answer a quick survey, um, it should pop up at the end once you close out the webinar and you'll get a reminder about it tomorrow mm -hmm. as well. That really helps us with planning um, future shelter, uh, shelter series um, events. 
All right. And so I am going to share my screen again and then turn it over to um, Professor um, Craig. All right, there we go. Well, thank you, uh, Clarissa, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. I was very excited to um, uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to speak to the, the group today until uh, this morning at breakfast. And um, I was having breakfast with my wife. And, and you know how you do. Um, we were discussing our day. And I, I told her that I was going to speak to your, your group this afternoon. And she is familiar with the group and she knows um, several people associated uh, with the group. And um, she couldn't imagine why you would invite me to speak uh, to your group because she knows that I don't know the difference between Queen Anne style and Attila the Hun style. So she, <laughs> I, I, it kind of shook my confidence and I wasn't as excited to speak uh, after that, but I, I assured her that I was only being asked to speak about Josephus Daniels and um, not to uh, speak on anything uh, that I don't know anything about with uh, respect to, um, to architecture. So um, I, I thought that what we would do is I would, speak briefly on, uh, give you um, a timeline for Josephus Daniel's life, but also to work into, um, given the interest of, of the group, to work into the timeline, uh, some of the homes uh, in which he lived uh, throughout his life. So if we could start the timeline, um, uh, Clarissa. So Josephus Daniels was born in Washington, uh, North Carolina in 1862. That's of course during the, the Civil War. Uh, his father uh, served the Confederate Navy as a shipwright and um, actually uh, so a, a somewhat convoluted story, which I, I won't trouble you with. Uh, he actually died uh, uh, during the war, which was killed uh, almost accidentally by Confederate troops. Um, and uh, before he died, uh, Josephus was the middle of three boys. So one of the brother, the older brother had been born before uh, the Civil War, and then another brother was born um, toward the end of the war. The father had moved the family um, out of the harm's way of the war because uh, Sherman had an army coming from South Carolina. Grant had an army coming south through Virginia. Fort Fisher has fallen, and uh, excuse me, Fort Macon had fallen. Fort Fisher would soon fall. So uh, Josephus's father, who was also named Josephus, um, he saw that the Civil War was going to meet in central North Carolina. So um, he moved his wife uh, and the, the children to the Outer Banks until the war was over. Um, after the war, he, of course, as I, I mentioned, he got killed. And then... Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, Josephus's mother was left with these three little boys who were seven, three, and, uh, and less than one year uh, old on the Outer Banks, uh, which at the time was um, not uh, the vacation haven that, um, that it became. Uh, but she had a sister, and her sister's husband had done well during the war as a merchant in Wilson, North Carolina. So they moved to, um, to Wilson, and if you want to hit the, the, the next button there, um, they, uh, he, Josephus grew up um, from 1865 uh, until he left home uh, in 1885, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, he grew up in Wilson, North Carolina, and always thought of that as his hometown. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, then. Um, I do not have a picture. I, 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 somewhere I have a picture of his home in Washington, North Carolina. As I said, his father was a shipwright, worked for the Confederate Navy, and he built... Um, the home that they lived in, uh, the young family lived in, in Washington. And that home looked very much like a, um, a New England uh, fishing shack. Uh, it was very small. If you've ever seen uh, an old New England fishing town with the shacks that were on the, um, literally on the docks where the ships came in, that's exactly what that house looked like. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it. I, I, I couldn't find uh, uh, my, my photograph. Um, 
but it, that's interesting because his father had spent a couple of years learning um, uh, to build some larger fishing vessels in New England. So apparently took that style, brought it back to Washington, and that's, uh, that's the home that they initially lived in. When the family moved to Wilson, as I said, I don't have a photograph of that home, but this is the old Wilson County Courthouse, which I have a map of Wilson from the 1870s, and it appears to have uh, been on the same spot that the current Wilson County Courthouse uh, is sitting on, which for those of you who know downtown Wilson is right on Nash Street. Uh, the streets in downtown Wilson don't run exactly north and south, but it's, it's, um, it's right downtown on Nash Street. And in this photograph, just to the left, is Tarboro Street. Um, and um, kind of if you imagine the back of the courthouse there, around the corner on Tarboro Street in the middle of the street was where um, Mrs. Daniels, Josephus mother's house was right in the middle of that block. She got a job as the Wilson postmistress. So in the front of her house was the Wilson post office and then the family lived in the, the, the rest of the house. Um, that house is no longer there. Um, it's the last time I was there, it was, um, a parking lot for the Wilson County Sheriff's Department, uh, further up that block on Green Street, which runs behind the, the courthouse is the, uh, Methodist church that Josephus and his family attended. He was a devout Methodist, uh, and that church is still, uh, is still there. Um, so why don't we, I, in the earlier slide, we on the timeline, uh, it mentioned that Josephus bought his first paper, the Wilson Advance. I'll talk a little bit about his newspaper uh, businesses um, in, uh, in just a moment. Um, why don't we go forward on the timeline, uh, Clarissa, to the next uh, entry there. So um, you notice there that, um, uh, you know, if you're doing the math, Right. He was born in 1862. He bought his first newspaper, the Wilson Advance, uh, which was the, the town paper uh, in 1880. So he was 18 years old. Um, I'm sure there are people who are, who are watching this um, who have uh, raised children. Uh, I have two grown daughters and I can just tell you that when they were 18 years old, if I could just get them to pick up the dirty laundry off the floor of their bedroom, I considered it a good day of parenting. So to have an 18-year-old who uh, owned a newspaper, uh, edited it, uh, <laughs> provided most of the articles, uh, that was quite an accomplishment um, at, at a young age. Uh, he ended up owning two more newspapers, uh, one in Kinston and one in Rocky Mount by the time he was uh, 21. Uh, a lot has, on this timeline, a lot happens in his life between 1880 and 1894. Uh, like I said, he bought three, two more newspapers. So he owned three newspapers um, and he goes to law school in Chapel Hill in 1885. And then he purchases a Raleigh newspaper also in 1885, uh, the State Chronicle. Uh, eventually he ends up with the, the Raleigh News and Observer. That's uh, 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 quite a story how he got from the State Chronicle. He actually, the, he sold the State Chronicle and then bought another newspaper, the North Carolinian. So that's five newspapers that he owned uh, before he, uh, he bought the News and uh, Observer in um, 1894. Importantly, uh, he also got married uh, during this period. Uh, in 1888, uh, he married uh, Adelaide um, uh, Worth Bagley. Um, she was the granddaughter of the governor, um, uh, Governor Worth, immediately following the, um, the Civil War. Um, I have a photograph of um, her house, but before we get to that, I wanted to show you that. No, that's, that's good. You're, you're, your timing is excellent. Uh, let's see the, uh, the Yarborough Hotel. This is where Daniels lived. Uh, in Raleigh when he first moved there after finishing law school uh, in Chapel Hill in 1885. In those days, law school was basically what we would think of today as one semester instead of three years. Uh, so it was just a term of studying the law um, and then uh, taking the, uh, the bar exam. Uh, and so uh, when he moves to Raleigh to run the State Chronicle, he lives in the Yarborough Hotel, uh, which is 
situated here. This is on Fayetteville Street, on the east side of Fayetteville Street, looking directly across at the Wake County Courthouse. Uh, in my time in Raleigh, this has been a location that has turned over a lot of different restaurants. Uh, the last time I checked down there, and I think this was maybe before COVID, I don't know if it's still there. There was a sushi bar there, I think, um, uh, recently. Um, this is a very nice hotel, probably the nicest hotel between Richmond and Atlanta at the time. Uh, I have a copy of the menu, which... Uh, I could read to you, but it was uh, in, the, in the hotel restaurant. Uh, it was a very uh, high class establishment and um, uh, Daniels resided here until uh, he got married. Um, let's go forward on the timeline then. Uh, so I think it's important to understand as we get into Daniels political career that um, the only reason why we're talking about Josephus Daniels as a political figure uh, and later as a military figure during the First World War when he's Secretary of the Navy, the only reason we're having that conversation, the only reason why, uh, or, or I guess a, a better way to say it would be, we wouldn't be having this conversation about Josephus Daniels as a political or a military figure if it wasn't for his um, financial success as a newspaper uh, entrepreneur. It's his success as a, as a businessman that he uh, leverages into a political career. And so the News and Observer allows him then to have political power and he's a voice of the Democratic Party in North Carolina uh, at that time. And so his ability to play a role in the uh, white supremacy campaigns of 1898 and 1900, uh, and often uh, I want to say something about the white supremacy campaigns in just a moment, but uh, his ability to do that was because he was a successful businessman. Uh, if you want to know how successful, um, so I've taken, you know, reconstructed some of the income uh, statements from the News and Observer, converted those into current dollars. He was probably, by the early 20th century, he was earning on an annual basis uh, in today's uh, dollars, something between one and $2 million a year. Um, now, you know, how much money is that? Uh, that certainly puts you in the 1%, uh, upper 1% of the income distribution. Uh, probably between one and $2 million is where the average of that is. So, you know, if you think the median is near the mean, uh, that probably puts him near the upper half of 1% of the income distribution um, uh, at the time. It's not rich in the sense that Duke or Rockefeller were rich or Carnegie rich. It's not that kind of rich. Uh, but he was certainly a rich man and he was able to use his, um, his, um, business success in the newspaper industry to leverage his, his uh, political career. So speaking briefly about the 1898 and 1900 campaigns, a lot of people focus on the 1898 campaign because it involved the Wilmington uh, uh, riot, but um, the, the Democrats take control of the House and the, the state house and the legislature in 1898. 1900, they take control of the governor's office and uh, uh, amend the, the state constitution to disenfranchise uh, black voters. And that's really then when the era of uh, Jim Crow um, uh, takes over in North Carolina until the civil rights uh, acts of, uh, of the 1960s. Um, Daniels becomes uh, a colleague of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he's a key advisor during uh, Wilson's 1912 presidential campaign, which w Wilson wins, takes office in the, the spring of, of 1913. Uh, uh, and um, from 1892 to 1912, uh, Daniels is a member of the Democratic National Committee, which was a much more important political position back in the days of smoke-filled rooms than it is, uh, than it is today. Uh, so why don't we go forward then um, to the uh, Bagley home. So this home, I'm sure many of you on this call have been by this home many times. It sits uh, at the corner of South and Blunt Street. It's right across the street from the, um, the prominent uh, Shaw University building. In fact, it's basically taken uh, from that, uh, from the lawn of, this photo is taken from the lawn of, uh, of that building. Interestingly, 
Daniels lived in this home uh, from 1888 when he first gets married uh, until 1913 when he joins the Wilson administration in Washington as Secretary of the Navy. Daniels never owned a home until he leaves the Navy Department uh, and comes back to Raleigh in the spring of 1921. He's almost 60 years old. Now, you know, we think of home ownership as kind of the, the quintessential uh, stepping stone to, uh, you know, kind of middle class solidity in, uh, in, in America. And here's a guy who, you know, basically has, has gotten rich without ever um, owning a, uh, a home of his own. Uh, so this home is where he lived. Uh, it was his mother-in-law's home. He lived there with his wife. And by the way, his wife, was, it, the house is not that big. It's interesting. His wife was the oldest of seven children. So um, it must have been a fairly uh, crowded home uh, for quite a while until some of those children started, uh, uh, started growing up and, and leaving home. So as I mentioned, so why don't we go forward then, uh, Cl Clarissa, I'll, I'll go quickly here because I don't want to take all of, uh, all of our time hit the, uh, the button there for his next uh, phase of his life. So he joins the Wilson administration as Secretary of the Navy. Of course, uh, uh, World War I comes along. And so there's a good bit of the book that talks about his um, uh, leadership of, of, of the US Navy during, during the war and also during the era of gunboat diplomacy before the war. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the 1920s are a period of Republican domination at the national level. So he kind of, uh, Daniels comes back to Raleigh, uh, is running the News and Observer until um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt is um, elected in the election of 1932. Actually, that should be 1933 to 42 because Roosevelt takes office in 33, asks Daniels to be the uh, ambassador to Mexico, and he stays in Mexico until Mrs. Daniels becomes uh, ill. Uh, and he returns home to the News and Observer until uh, he died in uh, 1946, uh, excuse me, 1948, which was his 86th uh, uh, year. At the end of his tenure as Secretary of the Navy, uh, and go to our final uh, slide there, if you would, please, Chris, thank you. Uh, he builds uh, the first home he ever owned, uh, which is Wakestone, uh, and uh, he they move into Wakestone in 1922. It's back in Raleigh, I guess, about 18 months before they move in there. And then there's a big housewarming party, in, uh, excuse me, uh, 1922. There's a big housewarming party on uh, New Year's Day, uh, 1923. Uh, and this is the, the property that we all know from, um, from Raleigh today. Uh, Josephus Daniels said that he, he frequently said that he built Wakestone um, with all the stones that had been hurled at him and the News and Observer for his editorial positions uh, over the years. Um, and I, I will make a couple of points here about Wakestone before I, uh, before I shut up and uh, uh, let the discussion proceed. Um, the... There's a there's it's not in this picture, but if you know the property, you know that there's a naval gun uh, sitting right out the, the front door there. Um, I was told uh, and I can't remember by whom, but I was told that the in order to put the gun there, the Navy Department had to declare that that was a naval base. Um, I spent a good bit of time in the Naval Archives and I could not find any reference to that property or part of that property being declared a naval base uh, for the um, for the uh, the gun. Um, the other thing is I've heard people refer to the gun as coming from a battleship. It's actually a, a quite small gun. It's the guns on. If you've ever been to the U.S. North Carolina, you know, the battleship guns are much bigger guns than those guns. That was a gun taken off of, I believe, a merchant uh, a merchant ship that it had. Uh, a gun mounted on it. And then the final thing I will say is um, I found in Daniel's paper that papers that um, he used a Navy engineer to uh, do a lot of the uh, layout and uh, an active duty Navy, Naval officer um, to do a lot of the engineering and layout and, and uh, uh, of the property, which, which I think today that would be considered a uh, violation of uh, of uh, the rules of what you can uh, what you can do in power, but with that, I think I'll I'll, I'll stop talking and let others uh, uh, join in. Clarissa, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Yes, it was.
Yeah. Actually, is it, can can I ask a couple of questions just to kind of keep the conversation yeah. going a little bit? Sure. I'm I'm curious. Okay, so Jonathan Daniels, the son, takes over the newspaper when when Daniels goes to uh, uh, goes to. Um, goes to Mexico. Right. So Jonathan Daniels leads the News Observer in a very different direction. And presumably Josephus Daniels is the primary stockholder, et cetera, et cetera. How, how is he feeling about what Jonathan Daniels is doing with the News Observer? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a very good question. And, you know, it's one of the kind of paradoxes of Daniel's life. I mean, he was, he spent his whole life, he was a, he was a teetotaler, and uh, he was always pro-prohibition. Uh, but the fact that all of his sons and all of their friends who lived right around the corner from him, literally, they were all heavy, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say heavy drinkers, but they all drank uh, regularly. And um, he, he never objected to that. And when, um, you know, uh, jo Jonathan and uh, Frank, the, the younger boy, run the newspaper while he is um, uh, out of the country in Mexico, he says, run it the way that you think it should be run, you know? And, and I have correspondence where Jonathan is almost apologetic about uh, running uh, ads for beer or uh, being too liberal um, in terms of the... Uh, um, you know, the racial policies. And, you know, Josephus, Josephus was not micromanaging from um, uh, Mexico City. You know, I think essentially he turned it over to the boys and, you know, he let them run it uh, the way that they wanted to run it. Having said that, when Josephus comes back from Mexico, Jonathan joins the, uh, the, the Roosevelt administration, right? So, you know, I'm... Um, uh, Frank Daniels uh, pointed out to me, uh, Frank Daniels Jr. pointed out to me that, you know, when Josephus ran the newspaper, he ran the newspaper the way he wanted it ran. When he let Jonathan run it, he let Jonathan run it the way that he wanted to run it. But when they were both in Raleigh, that didn't work. So when Josephus came back, Jonathan left town and then, um, you know, Josephus uh, dies later in the decade and then Jonathan and Frank uh, ran the paper uh, after that. So, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely had conversations about it, but he did not give orders and did not micromanage the management of the News and Observer while he was in Mexico. Interesting. And, and following from that, I mean, it's, it's interesting that then you have jo Jonathan Daniels kind of being studied as the quintessential Southern liberal. Right, right. So, the idea of what it meant to be a Southern progressive or a Southern liberal changed uh, following, you know, the white supremacy campaigns, what it meant to be progressive in the late 19th century. So, if we, you know, if we go back in time and we read about Josephus Daniels, Josephus Daniels was perceived as a progressive, you know, a new South Democrat. Uh, and it was Jonathan's generation of uh, new new South Democrats that changed what it meant to be a liberal Southerner, uh, I guess, starting with Jonathan, really, uh, in some sense, the 1930s. Wow. wow, wow. I, 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 this is all so fascinating. I want, <laughs> I want to come back, you know, and I don't know, Andre, if you have questions, you want to ask Lee before making some yeah. observations? Well, I do. Um... I think I've understood, by the way, I have your books. Uh, I, I bought them because I wanted to know exactly. Um, I've heard that when he, while he was Secretary of the Navy, that the term Cup of Joe came from him because they weren't allowed to drink on ship. Is, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So um, uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, seamen for uh, going back well into history had a reputation for um, uh, living um, <clears throat> rather roughly on shore. And also, of course, uh, there's the history of uh, the, the rum ration on board ship. Right. 
Um, sometimes people say Daniels got rid of the rum ration. That actually happened uh, under an earlier secretary of the Navy. Uh, but there were still, the officers could still have uh, alcohol on uh, the ships, on the base, and so forth. And so he abolished alcohol uh, in the Navy uh, on vessels and on uh, the base. But of course, uh, the appropriations for uh, 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 food and drink and so forth had already, you know, those were made by Congress. And so uh, the, the story is they went ahead and spent the money, but they bought more <laughs> of other beverages, including coffee. So the substitution of coffee for alcohol uh, became referred to as a, a cup of Joe, uh, Josephus right. Daniels, and shortened to cup of Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. Thank you for clearing that, you know, that up for me, because I, I thought, well, okay, we have to thank him for that, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now, what, what would you like for me to do, uh, Myron? Uh, well, talk a little bit about your family's relationship with okay. the Daniels. Okay. Uh, I was... Uh, my grandfather had four children, uh, three girls and uh, one boy. And that one son was my father who was Spurgeon Fields Jr. And um, when I grew up, because my father was in service. So I lived with my grandparents and I became more or less like their youngest daughter as opposed to their granddaughter. Because uh, I mean, you know, I didn't really have any rules. You know, I pretty much, ran things, so I thought I did. Uh, my grandfather at the time um, would sit and he would tell us stories about what he did, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with Josephus and Miss Jonathan and he, you know, and he always had, key, he had keys to the houses. He could come and go at will. And at the time, um, he, he always liked Buicks and, and, and he had a Buick. Uh, he would get a new Buick every year because the Daniels made sure it was the newest car or whatever he wanted. And so he was a Buick man. And uh, I remember someone had died and we went over to the house and she was, uh, she was in her coffin and she was exquisitely beautiful. She was dressed with pearls and diamonds. And I'm thinking, I, do I really want to see a person who's dead? I don't know, because I was a kid. And he said, oh, come on, she won't bother you. She's a nice lady. And so, I mean, she was fabulous. I, I, I'm not a morbid person, but she was fabulous. She was really dressed. And he came and went at his, you know, at his wheel and uh, they say, Spurgeon, I need for you to do or Spurgeon, can you get? So as I got older and I heard stories about him being a white supremacist and being a racist, I had a hard time trying to combine the two because the stories that my grandfather told me were nothing uh, as to what I had read. I mean, it was like, it was like a, it's like a malfeasance. It was like this and that. And I, I'm trying to figure out who exactly was this man that my, my grandfather loved him and he loved my grandfather. Uh, I think I've told the story before when he was uh, secretary of the Navy, uh, my grandfather was going through Virginia and he had a lead foot. Uh, we used to call him Lucky Cheetah. He loved to speed and he was speeding and someplace in Richmond, the police stopped him. And he said, boy, why do you have a car like this? And why are you driving this fast? And he said, uh, Mr. Daniel sat in the back and he was doing paperwork and he just kind of looked up. And I thought, oh, we just left him out there to hang the dry. And so he just kind of, he said, I asked you, boy, why, why are you driving this car so fast? You know, and is this your car? And he said at that time, Mr. Daniel spoke up and said, listen, my name is Josephus Daniels. I'm on my way to Washington to have a meeting with Congress. I need to go. And the policeman said, okay, sir, have a good trip. And as fate would have it, <laughs> when they came back through, who do you think they saw? The same police officer. And this time, he waved. So I, I, just, I just had a hard time, you know, how to think, how could a person give you keys to their cars and their homes and be a racist and and actually hate people who look like me. I I, did, I mean that still that perplexes me because my grandfather said that there were two there were two uh, Josephus. There was the public one and there was a private one. I have photos of uh, 
My grandfather would serve parties over there. I have photos with my grandfather and my other aunts and cousins with Jonathan. Uh, they serve parties and they would, you know, and I mean, and Jonathan was just as comfortable and they were, they were all African-American and he was just as happy and smiling with them as he possibly was with anyone else. So I think I see the dichotomy of the family and I'm sure a lot of families are like that. You, know, you have some pros and some cons. And I, I just often wonder sometimes how my grandfather was able to, to stay in the middle and, and, and you know, walk that plank like that because they, they took up for him. They came to his rescue, whatever he wanted, whatever he needed. And they were always there for him. And for my grandmother, uh, my grandmother had exquisite taste. My grandfather, uh, my grandmother was uh, a shepherd. Uh, the, the founder of North Carolina Central University is, you know, is in her family, you know, uh, James E. Shepherd. And so she, she would work in uh, white people's homes. She would, uh, she would be a maid and she'd clean up and she'd have all these wonderful pieces of crystal and cut glass, etc. cetera. And um, that along with the fact that my granddad had worked for the Daniels and he did all of these things it, it, it increased our awareness of, quote, you know, the finer things of crystal and flatware and china and, and different things. And I don't think any other people at that time probably would have had that experience, but because of my grandparents and where they live, because they live in Oakland and Oakland at the time, it was an up and coming area. That's where people in Oakland, black people in Oakland, the freedmen, uh, who pretty much had something, they all had trades and they all, you know, had a good living. And my grandfather was a leader. He was, um, people looked up to him. They always came to the house to see, you know, uh, well, Mrs. Spurgeon, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And I, sometimes I'd hear him say, well, let me talk to the, to the Daniels and see what I can do. I mean, I don't know what it was he talked about. I have no clue, but he would tell them that. And uh, the people were pleased. So he was like, a, he was like a touchstone, I think. I think he, probably mailed the, the two uh, ethnicities together. Interesting. Um, and, and let me ask Lee for comments. And if, if I, um, Does how do, how is how does how does this fit with the Josephus Daniels you wrote about? Yeah, so I think um, it's uh, um, uh, the book White Fragility and the more recent book by the CNN um, uh, commentator uh, Don uh, is it uh, Lemon? Don Lemon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think they ref the authors. Uh, of those two volumes refer to this situation where um, an individual has uh, a, a, a good personal relation, a white individual has a good personal relationship with members of, of the other race, but at the same time is supportive of a set of public institutional arrangements that generate inequality between uh, the members of those two races. And, and I think maybe what we're seeing with Daniels is someone who just lived that, um, that difference uh, to the nth degree, right? I mean, he, he was a leader. He wasn't just someone who supported the white supremacy campaigns. He was a leader of uh, the white supremacy campaigns. At the same time, he lived in a neighborhood when... Um, uh, other fashionable uh, white folk of his, his generation were moving to the north side of downtown Raleigh. They remained in that neighborhood and on good personal terms uh, with their uh, with their black neighbors. I mean, there's a story in the book where Daniels is traveling across the country and he comes back at a time uh, the Republicans, which was the um, the party at that time that would have been more supportive of, uh, of uh, racial integration, he comes across the, the Republican National Committee and he can't get in, but he has, he, Daniels has a, a, an African-American friend 
who allows him to get into the, the Republican uh, uh, National Convention. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's very difficult to explain uh, other than in the terms of on a personal level, um, he could have a good personal relationship with his friends and neighbors, um, but institutionally, he was supporting policies that um, work to their detriment. Yeah. Let me, let me ask, uh, what, okay, we're, we're in the, the Graves Fields house the, where Andrea would have grow, grown up. Yes. And, um, and, and, you know, I got a little bit passionate about trying to research about Willis Graves, Eleanor Graves, I still there's there's still way more to learn there. Still way more to learn about the fields, but Willis Graves was involved with the um, Emancipation Day celebrations that took place in Raleigh. He was ch chairman of it in the 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 decade of 1900 for Raleigh. He was the, their keynote speaker in 1899. Emancipation Day was January 1, and it was a very, very big deal um, on for the African-American community, celebrations. They had a big gathering every year downtown at what was then the, the auditorium. Um, and I remember just being so surprised when I was reading in their resolutions about how they were thanking Charles Acock. Yes. Very, I mean, very much thanking Charles Acock because he is supporting, he is supporting universal education. It's segregated, but it's, he's the first one who is saying, I support universal education. And, and, you know, your head is just kind of going, <laughs> this is, this is complicated. Um, um, and, you know, uh, ACOT goes off to Baltimore and gives a talk that kind of blows everybody's mind mm -hmm. um, that this is the white supremacist segregationist and what he was saying in that talk. And, and there's the African-American community passing resolutions thanking him. Where, where Daniels come down on education? So yeah, he was very supportive of ACOC. In fact, they had been childhood friends. Uh, and uh, the uh, ACOC's hometown, as you probably know, is a little mm -hmm. south of Wilson, but they, the ACOC boys had boarded in Wilson and they'd gone to the same school. Um, and so they, they had been friends uh, since childhood. In fact, uh, Daniel's older brother had been a law partner uh, uh, of ACOC's. And um, so he was very pro-education. There's, there's a, uh, a story in, in, in my book where um, at, at that time, the state legislature did not directly fund uh, public education, but it allowed local uh, uh, political units to have a referendum on whether or not they would be taxed to support local public education, and then the state legislature would provide matching funds. So Daniels, uh, in his early newspaper businesses, one of the ways in which he made money, he often broke even on the newspapers, but he made money as the printer uh, for uh, the government. So he, he made more, in the, in the 1890s, he made more money as the printer to the state of North Carolina than he did running his newspapers. Um, and in those days, the government didn't have its own printing presses. So as part of a kind of a patronage to reward loyal uh, uh, newspaper uh, owners, they would give them the, the printing contract. So, so Daniels, when, uh, I, I told you, he, he owned the Wilson Advance. So he got the local uh, uh, printing contract from the Democratic Party in Wilson. So... <laughs> On the day they're going to have the referendum, he's the he's responsible for printing the ballots, and the ballots were yes or no, and he only printed yes ballots. Ah, sneaky. So it was 
it was in the middle of the afternoon before somebody showed up and wanted to no ballot. So there were no no ballots because Daniels hadn't printed any no ballots. So somebody called him. Well, the, the Wilson advance was across the street from the courthouse. So somebody got Daniels. He came over and he said, uh, well, I, I don't support any. Uh, I don't support. No. So I didn't print any no ballots and I'm not printing any no ballots. So finally, a, a no ballot, some no ballots were drawn up and they were cast. But um, that's how Wilson got public schools. Uh, in the 1880s. So going way back, Daniels was uh, was for public education. Of course, he was for public education uh, uh, in, in a segregated uh, format. But um, they uh, they that, you know, being progressive at that time, uh, as we talked about earlier, meant support for education, but in a, in a segregated format. Let me ask this, I mean, following up on that, in effect, didn't Daniels have a huge financial interest in the Dem Democrats winning the legislature and governor's mansion back in 1898, yeah, yeah. 1900? Yes, he did. Uh, he was, I, I, I can't remember, he won the printing contracts for four or five consecutive, the, the legislature, of course, meets for two, uh, the legislative period was two years. So he was the, the printer to the state for uh, either eight or 10 years in that period. Um, and then, but, but what happens is he actually becomes, um, he becomes powerful enough that he can separate himself from the Democratic Party. He's making enough money later on from selling newspapers and ads in newspapers uh, that it actually, he turns the equation uh, 180 degrees and it's the politicians who start coming to Daniels uh, for support rather than Daniels going to the politicians for support. And it's about this period when he gives up the state printing contract because he can just make more money in the newspaper business than worrying about the state printing contract. Over that 10 year period, uh, the, the, uh, the calculus changes uh, for his business. And if I may, one more question. Talk a little bit about Daniel's relationship with Franklin Roosevelt. Well, Eleanor and Jonathan's relationship with with them as well. Yeah. So funny, funny story about that. Um, so the way that Daniels and Franklin Roosevelt get connected is when Daniels becomes secretary of the Navy, in those days, you hired one assistant secretary. And Franklin Roosevelt was an up and coming politician in, in the Democratic Party in, in New York. Um, uh, he was uh, among the younger group. He was, uh, of course, a, a, a well-known name. So in his memoirs, Daniel, and later in life, Daniels always claimed that he had his eye on Franklin Roosevelt uh, and knew you know, before uh, anybody else that Franklin Roosevelt would be a star of the Democratic Party on the national stage. Well, in his Daniel's correspondence um, in the Library of Congress, I found a letter that Daniels wrote to his wife after he's appointed Secretary of the Navy, and he's going to appoint uh, uh, FDR as his assistant secretary. And he says, I think I will appoint Frederick Roosevelt as uh, <laughs> secretary, as my assistant. So it's possible that he didn't quite know FDR as well at the time as he later claimed that he did. Uh, because he thought his name was Frederick Roosevelt rather than Franklin Roosevelt. But he does bring Franklin into the administration. Franklin stays the assistant secretary well into Ro uh, Wilson's second uh, term. And he only leaves the administration when he's nominated for vice president um, uh, with Cox on the 1920 um, uh, Democratic national ticket. And... J Jonathan then goes back into the picture. Right. So Jonathan essentially becomes, I guess, in today's like we were thinking of him as the press secretary, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, of the uh, uh, Roosevelt, late Roosevelt and early Truman uh, administrations um, after Josephus comes back from Mexico City in the spring of 1942. Shortly thereafter, Jonathan goes to Washington. Well, I'm, I'm going to switch gears and, and do my little thing about, about the, the house for just a second, and then we'll come oh, back. Sure. So I'm going to 
share screen if I may. Um, uh, okay, am I good? Good. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, and um, the Josephus Daniels House Wake Zone has been uh, had been on the market for a long time. Uh, this these are photographs from about uh, this is a, a sales brochure that was put together in about 2013. And actually, we took a, a very strong look at moving our office there with another nonprofit. Um, and, and not, not from standpoint, I have to kind of say the word honors the wrong word here. It, this is about history. It's about telling history. And, and it wasn't about Josephus Daniels. The great man is Josephus Daniels, a complex figure. And, uh, Leah, I, I dare say you, you know, He's probably the most important person to come out of Raleigh on the, the national stage mm -hmm. um, in Raleigh's two and a quarter centuries. Um, he's, he's a complicated person and has a complicated history and it's not the easiest history to, to talk about. So we were laying by and it. it's going to give you a sense of it. They, they, the Masons added a very large addition on the back of it. And we were going to use some of that in, in our plans if we, if we could figure it out. Um, the sales price at that point was five and a half million. Well, here's the little, here's the little bug. It's three, 3.89 acres. So almost four acres. It's zoned R4. But but for the house, you can't you couldn't build anything on uh, on the land because it had been determined to be of statewide significance. Now uh, again, this kind of gives you a sense of the auditorium. Glenwood Avenue is off to the right. Castle Street is off to the left, and you can see the house perched on a hill and the the uh, auditorium dropping down. And I guess one more time, Lee, we'll probably come back to the the compound that developed of Daniel's sons and other and and other members of the Daniel's family that was built right around this house. Uh, but I, I want to get over, you can see quite the grand house. The architect that, that Lee talked about went on to become quite a prominent architect in the San Diego area. Uh, very nice class colonial revival house. Um, and uh, interesting, this auditorium, which is uh, from the Masons. But it, I, I wanted to kind of get over here to, to, to showing you the, um, so there's some of the landscape around it. You can get a sense of how large this landscape was. Um, and this is, this is where I, I want to kind of lead us here. This house was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1975, or 1976. Um, National Historic Landmark is a designation that is actually higher than National Register. It, indi it indicates national significance. Raleigh has three buildings that are National Historic Landmarks, and North Carolina as a whole has just over 40 buildings that are National Historic Landmarks. The other National Historic Landmarks in Raleigh are the State Capitol, on for architectural reasons, and Christ Church, on for architectural reasons as well. You can see the house here sitting on the hill, and there's the auditorium behind it. To my knowledge, and we just got confirmation of this, we've never had a National Historic Landmark demolished in North Carolina. This program dates back to the 1930s. So it was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1975. 1990, it was designated a Raleigh Historic Landmark individually on the four acres. Um, 
National, uh, the Raleigh Historic Landmarks where you've got some teeth because you can't tear it down without, well, you can't tear it down because it's of statewide significance um, and anything built on the site or, or it, it goes through the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. The neighborhood is then designated National Register. And then there was a, a proposal to build new houses, tear down the auditorium and build new houses around the property back around 2013, which triggered an, a re, re, review of the, the designations. And it was determined that the entire four acre, almost four acre site was of statewide significance in addition to the in addition to the national his, uh, historic landmark designation of the entire site as national significance, so I'm sitting there going, okay, this thing's designated every which way, mm -hmm. but but that's not good enough um, because on on uh, January 5th there was a public hearing. No, January 5th, the day before January 6th, where the whole subject of 1898 came zooming back into the picture. There was a public hearing to delist the property by the city of Raleigh. Um, the application to do this was all based on 1898 and, and that Josephus Daniels was a, um, that the, you know, his role in 1898 made him such a, a, a bad person from a, a, a social equity and racial equity standpoint that the, the building needed to be delisted. Actually, it had to do with money. It basically turned the site into a development site for 14 houses in the one of the absolutely most wealthy neighborhoods of Raleigh. Nothing racially, racial equity didn't have a daggone thing to do it, do with it. The application was written by the land planner, uh, not a, a historian. I, I had my doubts about whether Lee was consulted about it. Uh, the preservation community was not consulted about it. I, I, I have to say I missed the public hearing because I didn't know it was going to happen. Nobody testified, which says nobody else knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So the building is in the hands of a developer who, who has made it very clear he's going to tear down the the, the building and and build fourteen out single family houses on the site. Um, I am immensely frustrated on multiple levels. One is. Why do we go through a process of designating historic properties and putting the protections on them if on, you know, if in a ring with nobody there, mm -hmm. we remove the designation after a half century of designations? Um, and the other part of it that is that I am a great believer, those of you who know me, know this, that I'm a great believer that our buildings can be very important in the path toward racial reconciliation, because there are opportunities to have conversations like the one we're having right now. I am not trying to defend Josephus Daniels. I'm not trying to, you know, harm Josephus Daniels. And my goal from this conversation is to talk about a very important person in Raleigh's history. And if the city of Raleigh's point of reference is to let's just pretend he didn't exist and that Raleigh had nothing to do with 1898, this is a big step in, in, in that. And I think that is, is shameful, but it had to do with money. And I'll just kind of leave it there and we can move on. Y'all want to comment? I agree. Money, money, money. Yeah, I, 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 I defer to your judgment. I don't know any, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't recall being uh, consulted uh, on, you know, that, that changeover and so forth. Uh, yeah. It's terrible. Well, let's, let's, let's move over to the- Are questions? Yeah. Sure thing. 
Um, <laughs> let's see. There was a question here in the chat that they had to do with um, your part of the conversation, Mark. Um, it was a question about the, the was the designation because of its association with Daniels or because, because of subsequent use as a Mason's Lodge? I don't know if you know that or want to speculate. The, 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 it was originally, the original designation had to do with history. The next designation also includes landscape. It did not, per, I've, I've been, I've had someone say, well, it, you know, it did include architecture. And in 1976, the building was still pretty new in the scheme of things. And it had a very large addition put on it. So in terms of its integrity as an art piece of architecture, they did at that point, I, I don't know, Lee, were you the first person to figure out who, the, who designed it? I think you were. Uh, yeah, I, 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 what I knew about that, so I had three names, uh, Rogers, Satterfield, and, and Dan Allen were the three names that I got from Daniel's correspondence um, in the Library of Congress to his, his oldest son was over, was in Raleigh, kind of overseeing the, the construction. And, you know, the, the, there are things, when, when you're writing a letter to someone who knows a lot more than I knew, there are things that are left out. But the way that I, um, I interpreted that was Dan Allen was doing the, um, the development of the site and the roads and the sewer and water lines and so forth in the neighborhood. Uh, Rogers, I think was the name of the, uh, the naval architect mm -hmm. um, was doing the, the, the actual engineering of the, uh, of the, the site and uh, Satterfield was the name of the person who had um, designed it. So, so those were the three people whose names I uh, became familiar with through Daniel's correspondence with his son and, and uh, maybe those individuals, I, I can't recall exactly who all was a party to all of the correspondence. Um. The, the 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 point here is we in terms of architecture it's it, you know when it comes to box checking so to speak clearly the box of history gets checked with this house I mean how could you not check the box of history with this house the box of landscape also got checked later but it got checked very unequivocally and in terms of architecture. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're right at a, a century. It's a century old now. It was, uh, it was pretty new when it, in the scheme of things when it was originally designated. Um, and that addition could come off very easily. I mean, if there's a connector between the house and the, the auditorium that could come off. There some there's some photographs of the back of the house. It'd be a pretty easy house. To, to do that to, but architecture was not a box checked back when. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you were doing it today, you might do it differently. So is that Clarissa, the question? Yes. Does that answer? I, I think so. And if somebody wants to follow up with another chat question, I'll, if I didn't get, if we didn't get there. And Rogers, wasn't Rogers the naval, naval guy? Yeah, um, I saw the, the comment on the chat there. So in, in Daniel's correspondence, he refers to both Satterfield and um, he refers to Satterfield and um, Rogers as architects. Uh, and uh, he talks about Allen, Dan Allen laying out the roads and, and lines and so forth. Well, Satterfield was one of the best builders. In Raleigh, I mean, he was very well noted as a builder. I see. So I, I, made, I, I think the comment there was very helpful. Um, I, I, I think in my words just a few minutes ago, I got those turned around. Okay. So Satterfield yeah. was the builder, Rogers was the architect, and Dan Allen was the developer, using language that we would use today right. of the of the site. That's right. And and Rogers is the young Navy guy, so to speak. Right. Right. That that's helping him out, and. 
he's from San Diego and it ends up he had quite a prominent career in the but none of I us knew anything that. about him. Hmm? I, I didn't know that. That's new, that's yeah. news to me. None of none of us knew anything about him. And again, this is why when buildings are around, you start learning these interesting connections. So if you were doing it today, you would almost certainly check the box of architecture, particularly if the auditorium were removed. Back to back to Clarissa. Back to me. Uh, yeah, that was from our good friend and historian, uh, Catherine Beischer, who contribute to that piece of information. Um, so yeah, so I'll go to the, the Q&A here. Um, we have a couple questions from um, Bill uh, Gelkison. I apologize, Bill, if I mispronounced that. Um, so this is for uh, Professor Craig. I remember reading in your book or somewhere that uh, this assessment of Josephus Daniels, he saw almost every issue as rich versus poor and except where race was, except where race was involved. He always sided with the poor. Um, I've tried to find that statement in the book, um, and I can't find it. Is it is it in there, or if so, where? I, I believe that state. I the the way you quoted it <laughs> rings a bell with me. I think that statement is in there, uh, but it, it it would take me a while maybe to to find it. But I believe it is in there, just okay. like that. That seems sounds like to me almost a quote on this issue from the book. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Brian Watson. I think Josephus Daniels got a loan to buy the Newsom Observer. Do you think that affected how he used the NNO? Did the NNO change editorially after he paid off the loan? Uh, that, that's a, a fair question. The guy who he did, he did buy, in fact, um, he bought the State Chronicle with a loan. Um, actually, actually, it's interesting. His first newspapers in Wilson, Kinston, and Rocky Mount were purchased with a loan. His mother, remember I talked about her house around the corner from the Wilson Courthouse, which was the Wilson Post Office uh, as well. His mother put up the mortgage to that house for him to buy the Wilson Advance. And the party that, um, that uh, made that loan to her was Althea's branch of Branch Bank and Trust, bb &T. Uh, before it was BB&T. A lot of people think branch means branch banks, but no, it was a guy. Uh, branch was a, was a person. Uh, and so that then, so branch was his bank, was Daniel's banker uh, down East. And then when Daniel's moved to Raleigh, his banker or his financier uh, was um, a guy named Carr, uh, Carborough. Um, uh, Julian Carr. Julian Spade. Yeah, that's the, I, I, whenever you go to the Durham Bulls ballpark, it's the, that's J.S. Carr Way, I think, running right next to the, the Bulls ballpark. He had bought the bird. He, he and his father had bought the Bull Durham tobacco label. And then later he bought out his father uh, and partners. And so he was a tobacco um, uh, entrepreneur and then um, went into textiles to make the little bags before, rolled, before Duke perfected rolled cigarettes. The tobacco was was shipped in cotton bags. Uh, and so Carr um, funded Daniels, but Carr, I'm, this is a long-winded way. I'm a college professor, excuse me. Uh, uh, it's a long-winded way of answering the question, which is Carr never influenced Daniels' um, uh, political views or editorial views in, in the newspaper. He was strictly uh, money behind the, the scene. And it's kind of interesting that Carr is one of the names that has been removed from buildings at mm -hmm. Chapel Hill. And, and but what's kind of, again, there, there's so many things in, in history that you just kind of go. Yeah, Carr, Carr was investor in the mill in Concord, which was the only mill in North Carolina owned and operated by an African-American. I'm trying to think of his name, but you you end up with with things like that that go on. Thank you. Col that Coleman, the Coleman Mill. Coleman Mill. Oh. Um, so we have another question from um, Bill about uh, Jesse Helms. Uh, Jesse Helms, U.S. Senator. Uh, from North Carolina lived across 
um, on Caswell Street from the Daniels house? Um, do we know if he had any contact with Josephus or other Daniels? Daniel is <laughs> in the compound. I know Helms worked for the NNO and then and, 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 and as a young man then, and when he was a senator, he was at war with uh, the NNO. So I went through the uh, Daniel's archives at, at the Library of Congress. And by the way, I was up there on some other business and uh, I had made an appointment to meet with well, one of the librarians. And I probably, we've all seen the movie uh, Jaws where um, the, the chief sees the, the, the shark for the first time and says, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Well, I was up there and um, I went over to the Library of Congress. I was there for a couple of days and I said, you know, I, Lee Craig, we communicated by email. I'm here to go through the Josephus Daniels papers. So I got all set up with my white gloves and everything. And the, the librarian was going back to start retrieving the boxes. They, the papers come out in boxes. And I said, before you, you know, before you get going, I mean, just how many items are we talking about here? Because that's how they catalog them by items. He said, hold on, let me look. And it was over 400,000. And I said, we're going to need a bigger boat. Uh, so <laughs> I was going to need more time to go through that. But my point is, in that 400,000 uh, pieces of paper, uh, and I can't say that I laid eyes on all of, all of them, um, I, I didn't see any correspondence between Daniels and uh, Jesse Helms. Um, now, I, I did see Daniels correspondent. Daniels knew every, everybody, anybody who was anybody uh, in American politics. I found correspondence with him for every president uh, going back to Grover Cleveland, every governor. Uh, except one. I couldn't find any correspondence between him and Calvin Coolidge. Um, so no Jesse Helms, no Calvin Coolidge. Uh, those are the two people who are, uh, who are missing from, uh, from his correspondence. I'm sort of curious about what, what A.J. Fletcher and um, there, yeah, there. I, that, that is not in the book. I would have to go back to my notes to give you anything uh, interesting on that. I don't, I don't recall anything off the top of my head. I, I will say that um, one thing about the house, what we haven't talked about is the lawn. Um, you show the side view from the north of where it goes around and goes down to the parking lot for the, the Masonic Temple. I interviewed one, uh, I've interviewed all of, grand, uh, of Daniel's surviving grandchildren who uh, wanted to be interviewed or were in good enough health to be interviewed. And one of them um, I interviewed, uh, Adelaide, um, and I was talking to her and, and she, I was trying to get a feel for the property. And I was asking her about it. And um, she was describing the gardens and the lawn that goes to the south, off to the right on the, di on the pictures, those front pictures that we're looking at. She said those ran all the way to the uh, Methodist orphanage. And I said, well, well, you know, Methodist or orphanage is gone, but Wade, Wade Avenue cuts through there. And she said, Wade Avenue doesn't go that far. <laughs> so, so she had not been to the property since Wade Avenue had been extended through uh, what was the, the lawn and garden of, um, of uh, Wakestone, which must have spread, you know, several blocks there down Glenwood Avenue, all the way to the what was the Methodist uh, orphanage. And and Wade Avenue, the construction of Wade Avenue cut through Oberlin, and um, that's right. Yeah, and I don't know if Andre, you have any recollections or <laughs> recollections or conversations about the uh, Wade Avenue was built to connect over to, to I-40. Right. And it, I mean, and, and it twists and turns partly on, on, I mean, it's following the creek down below Wakestone. And um, I've always sort of wondered if the auditorium got built with the, the wall, the, the, the stone right, on right. the auditorium was from the wall. Mm -hmm. That was along the the, mm -hmm. the the creek down there. And then it went up and it does an S turn to connect and cut right it cut right through Oberlin. Well, Under, yeah. Under, well I mean, I was just gonna say that uh, goes back to redlining, mm -hmm. and and it totally destroyed Oberlin. It just it people who had been neighbors, I hear them talk about who had been neighbors for years, were just basically cut off from their neighbors. 
because it just came right through. And of course, this goes back to red line. But if you were African-American and you didn't have the power, there was really nothing you could do about it. And, and one of the things about redlining that, that often people are mistaken about of sorts is they talk about how the banks did the redlining. It actually was the federal government, federal government that did the redlining and told the banks they where they could and could not lend. Uh, if they were lending in a category four neighborhood, which is typically an African-American neighborhood, right. they, the, the feds would not guaranteed the loan and so the banks couldn't make the loan. Back to Clarissa. Yeah, we only have one question left. Um was about who the developer is. I don't know if you want to uh, get in all that, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean it's I'm sure it's easy big, enough to find out. But Beacon, Beacon Street properties, Jim Wiley. Um these you know, if you go look at it, the, the website, you can see that they, they do new construction and wealthier uh, wealthier neighborhoods. Um, I, I, I talked to them trying to say we would be interested in buying the house with enough land to keep the house. And, you know, that would reduce the number of houses, new houses. But I would not, I would expect that we would have to pay a premium to do that. And he was... Um, not at all interested in having a conversation. Well, why were they able to uh, have the hearings and have the meetings and not make them public? Well, it wasn't a matter of not making them public. It was a matter of who noticed, who noticed went to. Oh, the small print. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it fell in the category of, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, one of my board members just went off the the uh, Raleigh Historic Development Commission this last year, and I called her and said, "What the heck happened?" I mean, I completely missed it. I completely missed it. And she said she knew nothing about it, and she had just wow. gone off the commission. It was, and I, and I'm not saying it was. I'm not saying it was done in the dark of night, but I will say that there wasn't a whole. I think someone would have contacted me if they had known. Well, I think it was shady, quite frankly. So there, shady, shady boots. That's what it was. Uh, I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> You're my friend. <laughs> I think it was a cynical manipulation of the process. Yeah, yeah, shady. It was a cynical manipulation of the process, yeah, and shady. I'm. And as I say, this this is probably the most designated house in the state of North Carolina, and it's going to be torn down. What is wrong with this picture? Something's wrong. It's not right. Now, just one more comment from one of our um, Preservation NC friends. I'll just read that, and we'll uh, end our Q and A there. From um, Sally Greaser. Uh, the land on which Wakestone was built was part of Fairview Farm, which was owned by my great-grandparents on my father's side. When my great-grandfather died, my great-grandmother sold it, but reserved one block for herself and the block where the Daniels built. Okay. So thank you, Sally, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's all the questions um, that we have. Any other comments from our panelists? I, I thank you for, for inviting me. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, thank so you. did I. Very interesting, thank you. as always. Yay. Thank you all both very much for doing this. And I, I mentioned I, I had a class this afternoon at Chapel Hill where we talked about how preservation can be a, a force in having conversations about race and racial equity and racial reconciliation. And, I, and this house is the opposite of most of what we are looking at. I mean, it's kind of the, usually we are looking at, I can say the, 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 the site that is either specifically African-American heritage, a church or school, or, you know, home, that sort of thing, 
forth something like a slave quarters or a free blacks home, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's not much of a place in North Carolina that tells the story of 20th century race and late 19th century race. There's probably not a, much of a place in North Carolina that doesn't tell the story of what went on in North Carolina regarding race than the J.C. Daniels. Well, I mean, I, I just think story. it's sad because houses, uh, houses have histories and they have stories that need to be told. And people who who don't know history, who want to learn it, uh, what better way to go and see and touch and, and see what it's all about. So it's just unfortunate, very unfortunate. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, Professor Craig. Thank you, uh, Trevor and Andrea for joining us. Oh, thank and you. I wanted to mention to you all, please do take the the survey that pops up at the end, or you can take it tomorrow when you get the little reminder email. Um, we will, of course, be continuing on with our shelter series, and um, you can check uh, Preservation NC um, for information about upcoming shelter series, and we will have a recording of this program um, up in, and out um, to our folks I'll have it done this week, so you <laughs> you, can, <Good. laughs> you can check for it um, on our website uh, this week. But thank you all again. Well, and I would like to say thank you, Clarissa, for setting up the shelter series. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, we're losing Clarissa. Boo hoo! Boo hoo! Yeah. And she's going to a great new job. I'm really proud of her. As, it, I mean, it's really a, a, a great, great step forward for, for her. It's a big step back for us. But thank you so much, Clarissa, for, for putting these together and shepherding us, us, shepherding us through this process. You all are so very welcome. Um, I'll send you a box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure doing this. I've learned so much about so many different, different things. Um, in North Carolina about my home state, about, you know, the neighborhoods that I grew up in that I didn't know about. So um, I'm not going away. I just won't be visible. I'll be one of the people asking questions in the Q&A and letting somebody else moderate. <laughs> but um, thank you all again. And um, we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.